So good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Julie Kane. I'm on the planning committee for all these events that are leading up to the big renaming celebration. So 25 years ago, almost to the day, the Nez Perce tribe acquired this huge collection that's on display in here. It's one of the oldest and it's certainly the best documented collection of Indian artifacts in the country. And it's not so much now owned by the tribe as it is being cared for in partnership with Park Service. And we're just really thrilled to have it and we're going to shed that one more uh, uh, hand of colonialism by renaming it on June 26th. And, that, and we hope that you, you can all come to that. that that event, there will be a horse parade and all kinds of things going on, booths, and it'll be down in the park area down below here. So we, we welcome you all to come back for that. Um, Nakia is part of the planning committee. I also wanted to acknowledge Kehlani Scott, who's sitting right in the middle. Um, Stacia Morphin, Stacia's our project coordinator. Uh, Jason. Lyon, Beth Erty, uh, Thomas Gregory, Darren Williams, and Christine Lear. That's this planning group that's been working on things for the last six months. And we're just so happy that you're all here to share this day. And uh, before we get started, I would like to introduce the Vice Chairman of the Nez Perce Tribal Executive Committee, Shannon Wheeler. Shannon will do a blessing and then uh, a welcome from the tribe. Thank you, Julie, and, you know, uh, for the planning committee, you know, please give them a hand, you know, they, they deserve it. <laughs> so, uh, blessing, you mean by opening remarks, or do you mean a prayer? <laughs> so, uh, I'd just like to start, you know, with a few of, uh, words from our language, you know, Kachiyat, Yat, Nunyam, Haniwa, Ki, Yat, I just like to thank the Creator for this beautiful day that we're that we're all here, and for this land, Kiatawatis, this land, a Yai, where the where the creek meets the river, and thanks for blessing all of us today, and we come to you, Paiyatsatats Tamina. Come to you today, the Nimipu, come to you today with a good heart as we as we as we offer this this name changing and, and the work that is being done today. It's very important that that uh, that this happens because of the things that were mentioned before and, and you know we would hope that we would hope that uh, in the future you know there's other uh, belongings of the Nez Perce people that are out there. But sometimes, you know, our history isn't written from a certain time before. So a lot of that is passed on from generation to generation. We tend sometimes to lose some of those skills. They'll come back around at some point in time, but it's always good to have those, those belongings so that you can reference them and know why you do things or where you come from or where your skill comes from. And it, and it ties to our culture and to our language and to who we are and to, to the things that, the seasons that, of how, the times that we do things. So it's important uh, that this uh, collection is here and that other collections are recovered in time, that it'll be a reflection of who we are and allow our people to understand that, that you're capable of these things. And it's good to be able to know why, why I, I'm good at quill work, or why I'm good at tanning hides. And it encourages that in our youth. 
because you know we've, we've assimilated very well. We have doctors, we have MBAs, we have carpenters, we have uh, uh, all different kinds of people. Our, our tribe is so diverse that all of these different professions, we are part of that, we are that. But there's also our traditional way of life, which is only us. And we should want to share that with all of you that are here today. But a lot of times it takes that recovery of items so that we can maintain who we are, so we can help remember who we are. So, you know, without, uh, Without everyone's help in this room and other people across the nation, that these types of things wouldn't be possible. So we'd like to thank you today for, for gathering here. And you know, I get an opportunity to uh, introduce a good friend of mine and uh, a co-worker that uh, is far more knowledgeable on our cultural uh, the cultural aspect of, of the tribe than me, you know, he's like, he's like LeBron James and I'm just like me. <laughs> so, I mean, this guy's far greater than me at that this stuff. You know, I'm a better golfer, as you can tell. I'm, I'm just dressed for golf. <laughs> so I was, uh, I was the last guy on the shelf to be picked yesterday to come here and, and talk uh, and introduce you guys. So it was like, it's not the first time I was at, uh, the last choice, but <laughs> I'm glad that I'm here and being able to come and speak with you and, and share some thoughts and, and about the tribe and about our people and the work that we do. So it was either come here and be with Nakia or go golfing and be with his older brother Dion. So, <laughs> he was a great guy too, so but uh, as you can see, I'm still probably going to go golfing, uh, but I, I will spend uh, the time here because I can't pass up an uh, uh, opportunity to hear Nakia Williamson speak. So without further ado, uh, Nakia. Katiaya nuna moikalo ki paitse kina ki la ump chicken kinuna metal ki halalite ka oikolo ki stikasta ki touch biomkin again i'm just very appreciative you know to our vice chairman um shannon we are we are for uh, his indian name uh, I will take some exception with the LeBron James analogy because they just got put out the other day. So I don't know how, and they're no longer in the playoffs. And had to hear my mom cry about that for the last couple of days. But nonetheless, you know, this is a very great opportunity, you know, to be here and to address you fine people. Those of you that have lived and been a part of this land, been a part of the work that we have carried forward, you know, from years back, uh, even before the acquisition of the collection, but the, the groundwork and the uh, really significant contributions by many people. And I can think back even myself personally, you know, to this, this actual facility, this institution here, the Nespers National Historical Park. As a young boy, you know, I, I had a connection to this park via my, my auntie, who was uh, also a ranger, and she's back for round number two here in your uh, latter years in, in life, but she would bring us in and we'd participate in the cultural days that would happen back, I think it was in the 80s, and I was just a young boy, and, and uh, even myself uh, as a young boy, in those times, it's not like now, it's like we were somewhat feral children, I guess you might say. <laughs> in the morning, you went outside and you weren't expected to come back till dark time. And so we would walk down the creek, we'd come down to the old museum that was down below here. Those of you that have been around for a few years may remember the old museum. And we'd come down out of the hot heat as young kids and we'd push the button and watch the movie. And you know, that was a part of our, our, I guess, our entertainment at that time. So I'm very grateful to the 
this institution that was here and how it was created, how it came to be, I think is really a, not only because it's telling the story of our people, of our land, of our history, our culture, it's interpreting something that is so very near and dear to who we are as Namipu today, but, but also because our leadership at that time advocated to have this facility placed here. And I've looked at some of the legislation of, of when that happened. So, you know, the predecessors of uh, Chairman Wheeler, now Vice Chairman Wheeler, get, still getting used to that, have put a lot of work into even the establishment of how this park even came to be. So I think that's really important to acknowledge too at this point. Um, and, and so I just wanted to mention that. And, and also, you know, I did mention at the small gathering we had with the soft opening down at the casino, that my connection to this time was a very kind of important like period in my life and it was a convergent a convergence of a couple different events that had happened. You know, I was a young man at the time trying to figure out, just like a lot of young people, my way in life and what I was gonna do, what kind of path I was gonna take. Originally I thought I was gonna be working in a museum field, be a curator, kind of like under the tutelage eventually of uh, Bob Chenoweth, who's who's out here. And so I was fortunate to be able to work as an internship when I was at the Institute of American Indian Arts. I was taking museum studies class and I was able to get this opportunity to work and do this internship. And then that ended, I think that was 95, 96, somewhere in there. And then they picked me up to do some of the other work that, and that was right after the time when the collection, it was unclear, I think 93 is when I think we were notified that I, I think Oberlin College and the the, the powers that be there had decided and I guess realized how priceless the collection was and so that was when the request was made and so the tribe and me just as a, as a, young, a young, young man or, or a boy at that time had the ability to spend that time with the collection and um, that was a part of my story at that particular time and, and I also should recognize the, the speaker, the lady speaker that happened, uh, that occurred a couple weeks ago, Tisa Matheson Pinkham was also there at that time, as well as the staff that were, were there. Bob was here, Linda was here. Uh, of course, Kevin, Kevin Peters was here and had a real important role in that. Many people that were here at that time. And so, you know, that was a really critical time for me that I was able to observe firsthand from my, my, my I guess, my personal level in terms of, uh, at that time, as, I guess as much as you can take in as a 20 year old or, or however old I was, 19 or 20 at that time. So, you know, that was a really important uh, part in a kind of a, in those formative years in terms of not trying to figure out what kind of profession I was going to go into. Ultimately, I, I, uh, an opportunity opened up at the Nespers Tribe and a cultural resource program where I, I, currently, I currently am. So, you know, that was kind of a, a little bit of the history of how how I came to be here and how I came to be connected to this collection um, in, in a, this very, very beautiful collection of, of ethnographic material from the Nespers people, from our elders, that represents our elders that lived on this land. And so, you know, I guess the one thing that I think more broadly of how we can interpret this collection is it, it, it illustrates that relationship that our people nurtured since the beginning of time. It illustrated these symbols that are written as our laws say, as our songs say, about our laws aren't written in a book, but they are written on the land. And that's why our people went to the land because it was reminders to us. You know, the, the pictures behind me that are related to the coyote stories where coyote broke the dam at Salida Falls traveled up into the Clearwater region, the Lower Snake region, Cotispa up to Tusa, up into here, down to the Salmon River country, Snake River Plains, and out to Kusaina. And that travel of Itziyaya or Coyote describes our usual custom area. It's not just the fantasy land. The places where he was gathering resources point out the places on the geography that we were to go to gather the same resources as Nespers people. And these were the tools that were used to, to talk about those important points of geography, but also the proper times in which to carry out these lifeways that were so important to our people and continue to be a, a big uh, aspect of our identity, of how we carry forth our identity. So the, the picture on the left was a, uh, a site down what is now called Vigs, Oregon, 
and it represents those rock pillars, represent Coyote Sons. This site was interpreted to me by Bilo Tsenmai or Rachel Wapshila, who we visited that site, and she said when they would travel down to Slilo before prior to inundation, I think in 1947, with the Dallas Dam, they would go camp with relatives down there, and then they would get fish, and then they would go up to Mount Adams and pick huckleberries. And she said every time the elders would travel and they would tell that story, that's Coyote's three sons he left behind when uh, he broke the dam at Slido Falls, free and the Chinook salmon so they could come up river. And of course, the other site here on the opposite side, you know, that talks about our relationship to Kusaida, our buffalo country, is the, it's a Yaya Nimtikam, which is on the south fork of the Clearwater River, the dam that he is partially built before he re realized his folly of trying to be purely a fisherman and uh, he realized halfway through that all the people were going to Kusaina, our buffalo country, and then he realized that, that we can, I can't just be a fisherman, that it's time to go hunt buffalo. And that's, that recreated the tradition for the Nespers people that we were not just fishermen, but we're also buffalo hunters. And so there are all these markers and symbols on the landscape that our old people would interpret. And they would interpret in the form of many different expressions that they would have you know, some of these things that were worn that represented these original laws that our people followed. And further, these things were also placed on the land as well in the form of what we call tungloi, these very sacred sites on the left. It's probably not that clear, but there's these rock cairns that, were, that would happen, uh, that would occur in some of these very sacred areas. This one is on the Kusai Niviske, on the original Lolo Trail. Uh, later on, was used in 1877 when uh, you know, many of the five, five, five or more bands were going over to Montana to escape uh, war and to uh, try to find a place to live. And so, this is one of those sacred areas that our people utilized. Each one of those rocks were prayers that were supplicated um, by individuals for generations. And some of these rock cairns are. When I first went there, I think about 15 years ago, the rock cairn was about eight or nine feet tall. So you can imagine how many generations of Nespers people were utilizing that site. And of course, the Piswatimanin are the written rock at uh, in the Katpa, now known as Buffalo Eddy, which is also a managed uh, site here by the NPS. So these symbols are very important. They're written on their land, they're written on the geography, but also these expressions that our people would would do to remind uh, remind themselves of the accountability that they had going back to the time of creation. And this was also represented in the clothing that our people would wear. In our way of life, that in the beginning when the four-legged animals were, were the first, as soon as the Natsokh salmon stepped forward, on our, to advocate on our behalf just prior to our creation, it was the four-legged represented by the tapit tawasin or the white-tailed buck that was to step forward and he was gonna provide his hide because we were pitiful, we had no covering, we had no fur, and his horns would be for the tools because we had no, no claws like a grizzly bear. And, and it was at that time, all the animals were named and were given a order in life and, and so, that's what's represented in many of the clothing you see and in the Spalding Allen collection. That was a time coming out, of course, when there was very tr a few trade items that were in our area. Uh, some of these beads that you see here, they call them Russian trade beads, were originally made in, I think, Murano, Italy, and then, and then traded to the Russians, and they were traded around the, the Pacific Rim down the northwest coast to the mouth of the Columbia River and then up to the very uh, important trade area of Dallas, Oregon, which, are, which is now Dallas, Oregon, which we call Woods Kapupa. And, uh, and so you'll, you'll see that oftentimes that in the older clothing, especially in what you see in the Spalding Island collection, those are all original ways in which minimal alteration would happen to the hides and the reason for that was that the hides and that going back to that original story of when our people were given that by the animals, the white-tailed deer, the elk, the bighorn sheep, the antelope, that those would be the ones that were gonna form our clothing. And in order to pay maximum respect and honor to that law of that life that was given, they 
chose to use the natural shape of the hide in order to accentuate their own body and to cover their own body. So instead of, of taking a piece of hide and trimming off all the extremities to make it to, to suit uh, you know, your ideas of some sort of like tailored clothing like we see nowadays, they would use the natural form and the natural shape of, of the hide to, to use as decoration. And so that's the case here. And uh, I think back to one of my teachers when I was like 15 or 16, when I was sought, sought out knowledgeable people, one of my uh, good friends there, uh, Doug Marsh, um, recommended this man by the name of Elmer Whiskey Paul, who was, uh, many of us from this community remembered him. He was a very knowledgeable person. And I was fortunate enough to spend a little bit of time with him. And uh, in the collection, here, there's some of his items. He was especially known for making these drums and he would construct them out of buffalo hide. And unlike a lot of the drums you see at the powwows nowadays where they're nice, clean, white, and sometimes they just go buy a, a raw hide, you know, from a hide place and then they wet it. And he would take the process from the animal all the way to the end product, but he would always leave some of the um, fur on the edge, the, the buffalo fur. And I would always ask him because that, I never seen drums like that, the ones you would see at the modern powwows. And, and he, I asked him, why, why do you leave the fur? How come, would not you want to take all that off? And he said, the reason why I'm leaving the fur on is so that you'll know which animal that this came from. And, and I guess in that way, he's, you're paying respect to, to the animal by, by taking and leaving some of the character of the fur that the animal used to cover itself. And in this way, you see the same concept that happens, you know, in one in the two dresses that here we have here. I think the other one, the tail. So um, that's kind of a close up of the, the neck portion of, of the dress. And that little portion right here is the original tail. And so some of the early early dresses, but also men's shirts and other clothing, you'll see that that, that uh, tail that's left here on the women's dresses, but on the men's, it'll be on the bottom, the bottom part. Uh, in, in a lot of the early shirts, those that have cool work and have, uh, once they start to transition into beads, things start to change, but you also see the natural flow, the, the beads that follow that kind of form is not just a form and a design they made up, that's covering the scene in which the hind legs of the animals make in that form. And so the, the very decoration is, is emulating, if you want to call it decoration, I think it's a little bit more deeper than is emulating the natural form of the animal and thus paying respect to, to the animal and what it represents. So the same thing you can see, it's probably not that uh, visible, but I would encourage you after, you know, sometimes I look at the, look at the collection that is currently on exhibit, but, but the, how much they retained, and as somebody who's done a little bit of hide work myself, normally, uh, you know, most hide workers now will cut their legs off, cut the head off, because it just takes so much effort to try to tan those portions of the hide, because the, the animal, when they sit down on their knees, they callous it, and that, that will never really get soft. And so there's, it takes so much time, you end up ripping holes and things like that. And so the, the time it takes to tan those extremities is, was a very concerted effort that our old people did for a specific reason, again, to honor that life that was given of these, these animals and what they gave and provided to us. To the point where at the bottom, what would be the bottom, which would be the neck area of the dress, that you'll see these two portions right here, those two fringe portions are actually the ears of, of the, the deer or bighorn sheep. So they went to that length to, to retain even the ear holes that are, are a part of the decoration. And it's something you would totally miss unless you really looked at it and spent time. And so these are the kind of, these visual representations and expressions of that deep held knowledge and those indeed what we call Tamalwit our laws that tie us to the land are expressed all throughout this collection. And I think, you know, as, as uh, Vice Chairman uh, Wheeler mentioned, that when we look at those, they remind us of that, that law. Just the same way when you travel the land along the rivers, you know, and you look and you see different places where things happen, they re they're reminders to us of how we're accountable to the land. And in terms of our federally determined identity as modern Nespers people, 
people, modern tribal people, we often think of our our, our that federally determined identity that's tied to those treaties that are that are important. But again, our people were here thousands of years before those treaties were signed in. And, and those 58 chiefs that signed that treaty were preserving that way of life that was put uh, on paper under Article 3 of the 1855 treaty. So they weren't trying to preserve a right as we know it. They were trying to preserve their right to be who they were and are and to maintain that identity that's tied to the land and tied to the, the gathering cycle of our people that was so important. And I think a lot of our people understand this maybe don't give voice or words to it, but it's something they understand just by doing and not always talking about it, I guess, I guess like the way I'm doing it, but, but it's something that is it's something that's lived, and that's why we call it a way of life. And so that whole concept idea kind of carried forward in some of the other clothing. This dress that's on the right-hand side was collected at the Clearwater Battle in 1877, uh, just around July when the caches were open. Uh, by you know uh, Howard and his men. I think this was might have been uh, by uh, Sternberg, the surgeon that might have been associated with that. He collected a lot of these items that ended up in various collections, both public and private. But you can see that again the same concept. And and one of the original laws of how our people, you know, felt was appropriate in terms of acknowledging the men's roles and the women's roles was that. Originally, that the, the original clothing, from my understanding, and, and it's evidence in pieces like this, that oftentimes the men's clothing would be constructed out of the, the male species. The women's clothing would be constructed out of the female species. And if you look at this dress, and this is one of the things I often look, look at when I look at uh, old time clothing from pre-1870s time period, is you'll see what would be on the hind legs on those projections right would be right under the armpit of that dress. You can see those patches right there. Those patches are the thin areas in the hide that were where the udders of the, the female animal was. And so when you're tanning that hide, you'll either thin it out and it will tan, but you'll still see it there. But more than likely, it's going to rip out and tear out. So it's going to necessitate. So that's why there's two matching patches on each side. And you'll see in the, the dress, again, probably a pre-1880s um, dress here, you'll see the same area, you see that hole right there? That hole is not a hole that was hit in the hive, that hole is the thin area of the udder. So again, you can see that same concept being carried forward in the, you know, the early clothing, pre-1900s, pre-1880s clothing, and definitely reaching back in, into the Spalding Allen collection, you see that really accentuated to the, to the maximum where you have the ear holes and every, every significant aspect and natural feature of that animal retained in, in, in utilized and incorporated into the, the clothing. Again, it, so this goes back to, to our laws and hearing uh, elder people talk in the, in the longhouse and in the, the knowledgeable people that carried this way of life and that the things that we wore was representative of that relationship when we wear buckskin, it, it recalls back to the time of creation, and the buckskin that we wear represents all those things that live on the land, all the things where we take sustenance, the roots, the berries, but also the four-legged creatures. And then you'll see they wrap the kilos, the otter fur in your hair, and that represents the loud tips, those things that are in the water, those beings that are in the water, the salmon, the lamprey, all those things that our people relied upon. So when you see people dressed, and even though they may not like broadcast that or elicit that, that's what that is representing, that relationship of those terrestrial species that we relied on in the past and we still harvest and maintain a connection with today, and those things of the water. And again, going back to that story where our Nespers people were not just to be fishermen like to the west, we were buffalo hunters just as much as we were fishermen. And so you'll see those same elements move uh, that carry forward in the, the clothing that's being worn. And uh, these these bits of clothing are, they, they definitely have a story that's attached to them. They definitely have a, a story to tell us and to interpret to us. And uh, again, this is a man's shirt, uh, not from the Spalding Island collection, but it's a later shirt. I didn't have any really 
good images I could use that were showing. But the, again, you could see that natural, the natural form of the animal, the hind legs, and you can see where the tail was. These two shirts were made not of bighorn sheep or deer, but they were constructed out of um, tokolainen or uh, pronghorn antelope. And how you know that is, and again, the pictures aren't that clear. It's more clear in this one where you see that hole right there. And oftentimes in antelope where you'll see the hind legs. This, so this would represent basically the back of a hind quarter and that middle part is where the tail would be. The tail wasn't left on this arm. Maybe, maybe the hair got, got damaged and you know, oftentimes the hair will, will, uh, will fall off over time. But you'll see these two kind of uh, points right here where the hide has some irregular, but they're both in that same spot where you see the, the hide drop down. And over here on this shirt, which this shirt I think is in the Peabody, and it's um, maybe, it's not documented like the Spalding Allen collection, but it's probably likely from the same time period. And you'll see that same hole there, and it's less visible right there. So the biology of uh, those um, pronghorn antelope, they're much, even though they look like a deer and they call them antelope, they're actually more related to a goat. And they're, uh, they're the fastest, second fastest land animal on the, on the planet. And um, those, and, and I have very, very little bit of experience, but that's the, one of the first thing I noticed on those hides. I can, probably a hand, probably five antelope, antelope hides, and on their rear, and I, I didn't know this, so they have another thing too, is when, when their feet come down, all other animals, all ungulates, they have those dew claws that are up above their main claws proper. The antelope, pronghorn antelope, doesn't have those dew claws, and so they're, they're really different. They're, they're much more different than most of the ungulates that we harvest up here. But in addition, those two areas that I've been pointing out on these shirts are, are the gland, there's some sort of gland that's there, so when you tan it, and you, or if you make raw hide, you can see, you can actually hold the hide up and you can see through the hide because that's a thin part of where those glands are. So again, those become a part of the, the shirt and part of the, the item, again, paying, paying homage and respect to, to that life. Uh, this shirt on the left is a very significant shirt. It appears in the immediately post-1877 John Fouch photo of Chief Joseph in Matoya, that, that just right after Bear Paw, when the first photos were taken, and he's wearing that shirt over at Fort Keogh. So, um, I mean, it's not specifically related to the small down collection, but I think it's significant because it tells a story. It tells a story about the experience and life of our people. And that's what I think really what these things do is they tell a story, they document our history, the events that have happened, and one can only think of, of what events and what people were associated with the collection that we currently have uh, here available to us because of the, that fine work of everybody. Uh, here you can see some of the, the events that happened in the past. This was just down here at Ahiwili at the mouth of the, the creek here where they would have different celebration encampments and they're performing the uh, Talaklin ceremony and sometimes interpreted as a parade, but in actuality it's an honoring it's an honoring of past people, warriors, elder people, and then that's why the the uh, the outfits that were passed down, the buckskin dresses, the war bonnets, and that's why they're passed down, and it goes to a really deep teaching that we have. In other tribes, they might burn or bury their objects, but um, for us, there's a deep teaching of why they're passed down and not put in with our, our ancestors. They're supposed to have new buckskin when they crossed to the other side. The old buckskin, the things that were, were, were left for the people to memorialize our ancestors. And indeed, you know, through our community, those families, even my own family have some of these items that have passed on generation, and they have the, the very sweat of our ancestors and the stories that, that those things have passed on. And I can think of even modern pieces that I've observed in my own life. Um, of individuals that these outfits, out of love, were created these outfits, the hours it takes to acquire the, the you know, there's some very amazing artists in the, the building right now here that, um, that understand how long it takes sometimes to gather the materials to, um, you know, to, to produce the items just in order to make it and then to carry out 
the actual beadwork or whatever ornamentation. It takes a lot of dedication and perseverance um, and to do that, and and it's a lot of love when you do it for 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 your children. And I I can think of, of times even in my life where I've seen outfits that were beaded, created, and um, I think of our leader that we lost in. Uh, just a few years ago, it's loops. Many of us know who, who he was. And there was a buckskin outfit that he would always wear that was made by his wife, Andrea. And I believe the designs were um, designed by Kevin Peters and she beaded it and got the hides together. And he was always proud to wear that outfit wherever he was, wherever we were at um, Bear Paw. I remember him wearing it at that time with his war body. And different important occasions, he would wear that. And I always seen him, just kind of took it for granted and as he progressed in age, and eventually he started to, to kind of forget, you know, um, get forgetful um, because he was over over 80 at that time, and eventually he passed. And it, it's our custom that that you put those things away. They're also shown at the time uh, of the ceremony. That's called the showing the clothes. Um, those of you that have seen that part, but that just follows the, the, when the body is put in the ground. But then after that time, they're put in the ground for a year, and then sometimes those are brought out. And I can think of the time when that first time that that buckskin outfit was brought out and worn by his son, it was at a celebration here in, um, at the casino. The, the, you know, it, it's, a, it's a casino powwow, and it's just kind of a celebration. But I remember that being a really, um, heartfelt time and I remember I had to kind of like choke back the, the tears of seeing that outfit because it, it reminded me of our leader, it reminded me of our, our elder that we had lost and so that's how meaningful these things are to us and if you think about the Spalding Island collection connect, uh, collected sometimes in 1830s prior to I think 1846, you could imagine the, the generations and generations of that whole process I just described just in a short 20 years compounding over and over and over again and what power that these items have when when that is continued over generations and generations. And so again, these these items have stories. You know, I talked about my uh, original uh, time here, spent the, the little bit of time I had in terms of documenting the uh, collection, which was a great time. Uh, last summer during COVID, there was a uh, there was a really interesting event that took place, you know, kind of on the heels of the whole uh, Mount Here incident with uh, Clyde Bundy and those characters. And they had a they had a, uh, a gathering up just up on top of the Camas Prairie. And um, because of that, because of this is the nearest federal, you know, uh, institution, I guess, in the area, there was some fear that there was the potential that something could happen here given he was just right up here just a few miles you know to the south of us and so we loaded up all of the the, the collection owned by the tribe in particular what it ended up being was this mostly the Spalding Allen collection and so you know the staff here we worked together with some of my staff at the cultural resource and we loaded up some of the tribes collection that's that's uh, held here and again most of it you'll see here that's um, Rob Taylor and Jason Lyon loading up the saddle uh, from the Spalding Allen collection, and we were trying to figure out the best way to do lock it up. But what if, what if this place got taken over? Um, you know, so the with with the consultation with every all the parties involved, we found out the best solution was to move it down with, with not uh, nobody knowing and move it down to one of the uh, rooms at the casino, and so. There I was in uh, the suite at the Clearwater Casino, surrounded by all this uh, material culture, mostly the Spalding Allen collection. I was stuck in that room for five days until you know the whole uh, threat had subsided. So that's part of the story too. You know, that's something I don't think nobody knows that that really happened, but that was something that you know that uh, Shannon was chairman at that time. It was something we had to really scramble, you know, to to make to make happen, and and uh, so. So that's, that, that becomes a part of the story. And when we think back you know, to what I was uh, mentioned before about the, the stories that had happened, you know, we can only imagine what occurred in terms of the life ways that were intact, the language, the language we're trying to preserve at the time that these items were, were created. It, you know, you can only imagine what was there, you know, and what was intact at that particular time. And 
I, you know, I think it's really important. I find it, in, in a way, it's, there's a, a certain bit of irony, I guess, that is connected to the collection. And you know, now we're to the point we're gonna we're gonna shed that kind of colonial history and, and something that I think elders, past elders, that felt that we need to name it. And now we're to the point that we're gonna do it, actually do it, which is I think very significant for us, um, for the Nespers people, and 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 to re contextualize the the items back and, and formally welcome back into our society into the community that they originally came from because back in 1846 when these items were taken and disassociated you know from our community that broke that that story that the oral history that otherwise perhaps those things may have been passed on yeah, maybe maybe they wouldn't have, but they could have been passed on. And the original context, the person who made it, the person who wore it, and what significant events that those those represent would have been remained intact. But now they went on this huge trip, you know, went all the way down through the bottom of South America, up the other side, overland to uh, Ohio, and spent all that time, and eventually came back uh, to us, and. Um, you know, again, I think it's really significant to think that that the context in which these were disassociated from our com community was was a concerted effort to basically wipe away all of what we hold dear as Nespers people. Our culture, language, and land was also being disassociated from us at that time on the on the heels of the treaty making time the wars that eventually happened, the, 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 the disease that came prior to. And so there was this mass disassociation that was happening of, of the land and the resources that were so much a part of who we are and who we are now, even today. And um, it's that's really what, what I think Spalding represented. He was only one person, but he represented that, that, that those institutions that sought to take everything from us. But fortunately, because of our elders, because of the uh, fortitude and the strength of our elders that we are still here, and, and now those have uh, come full circle and come back to our communities, and, and now we're, I think we're trying to put them back into their proper context and, and have them be a part of, their, our, of our community. So I think in, in a very ironic way, you know, where, where you think of the circumstances of how these things were taken, they were, they were taken with no intention of ever coming back here. They were taken um, as, a, as a form of plunder against our people that they were never ever going to come back here. But we kind of showed them that, that it inadvertently this, this hostile act that occurred with the taking of this material, this, this disassociation of this material from the context of our community and this land ends up being the thing that comes back to us and helps us move forward and preserves, in fact, preserves the oldest collection of, of plateau material. And, and if you look at it and you compare it to other collections, those are the really early collections that are over in Europe and Germany and some of those places that I've only seen pictures of, that this is on par with any of those collections. So inadvertently, uh, Henry Harmon Spaulding, the Presbyterian minister, uh, preserved an, an actual part, I think unwittingly preserved this important important pieces for the Nespers people, even though that was not his intent. So, you know, I guess it's true what they say, God works in mysterious ways. And, and so, you know, we're glad to be here at this point. And, and now I think, you know, these things are gonna be a part of our community and we're gonna create more stories and our generations that are come on along with us, we're gonna be able to preserve the knowledge, the history, the laws, that are in those pieces, but also the language that goes along with it that describes that. That was another important part of, I think, an exercise going back generations where our elders had to remember the names of these items. And, and so I think, uh, you know, for us, it's been a, a very a labor of love, I think, for the committee. And, uh, you know, so I definitely want to acknowledge them and, and to put up these events to try to share knowledge uh, amongst each other and to, to really mark this time as a time of celebration for all of us. And there's more events that's gonna be coming. And, and again, uh, Kaylani and Stacia has been doing a lot of work. Uh, Anne's not here, but she's been really instrumental. Of course, Julie, uh, Bob, and, and all those that have contributed to this effort. I think this is a long time coming. 
there's been, I, I look out to the crowd, I see a lot of people that have contributed to this effort as well, and, and the opportunity for our young people to take this and carry this into the future for, for our, our, our people that are following us, because we make decisions based not on who's here, but who's coming after us, just like our leadership does on our behalf. So, uh, I, so that's pretty much what I, I had to say at this point. And um, I really appreciate this time to spend with you. I'm glad you all came out and was able to uh, spend a little bit of time. So, Kabilets Tikan Ki Tamapaiks Ki Kilai Paduna. That's all I have to say at this time. Thank you. about this collection and it was written by Dr. Trevor Bond who happens to be here today in the hat over here on the side. He will be speaking <laughs> and introducing his book on June 19th. It's the event just preceding our renaming ceremony and if anybody wants to know what the new name is, it's a secret. <laughs> Nakia will be revealing that name on June 26th. There's going to be a horse parade. It's going to be a big uh, celebration so we welcome you all to come on the 19th here and then on the 26th down in the park uh, thank you to all our sponsors thank you to the committee and thanks Nakia that was awesome and that's the end of the presentation do you, do you want to take some questions yeah I can take some questions okay. all right I see part. some hands showing up so do you have, did you have a question, Bob son? Oh, no, I was prepared. <laughs> Anybody have a question of Nakia? I'll let him take them. Trevor? Um, one thing about those old pieces, like in the Spalmione collection, they have, a, they have a life and an energy. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about what it was like to be in a suite with them for those five days. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, to be honest, I didn't know as, uh, that first night I was thinking, am I going to get some visitors here or something, you know, because, you know, there's certain ways and, and certain protocols we have of, you know, sometimes you, there's certain things, and I, I think we try to follow those as much as possible, certain things that are better handled by women, other things that are better handled by men, and so, um, I mean, there's definitely a real strong energy that you, you feel from them, you know, just, just the history alone, I think, uh, but it was it was amazing to, to be surrounded by by those items, and I, I know our chairman was joking. He said, "Don't be dressing up in those and walking out." And <laughs> 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 yeah. I go out, freak everybody out, and have uh, have some pictures, uh, selfies of the artists. <laughs> no, I didn't do that. But, uh, but yeah, definitely, there's a, a very strong, uh, palpable uh, energy that that comes from those sorts of things, and. Um, you know they're 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 very uh, powerful you know to us and again you know what it signifies is that that broader uh, relationship that our people maintain that that relationship that has kept us here even today and that we're struggling you know even in the the four uh, lower snake river dams issue that the chairman's been instrumental um, as well as Kehlani, uh and, and others of leadership you know that that's our, our ability to preserve the leader and that's the Chinook salmon who I have a date for date with. Uh, as soon as I get done here, I'm gonna date, date with them at Rapid River, hopefully. So, um, but we're trying to preserve those, you know, quote unquote resources, as our chairman often, you know, says, is life sources. And I think that's a real, you know, significant and important, um, you know, term to use because they're they're more than just resources to us. They represent our life and and indeed our continued life on this land. Because we know if those things are gone, you know, we're gonna we're gonna follow. Uh, afterwards, and that's that's really what we're fighting for. It's not only our identity, but it's our very life in terms of what the salmon means to us, and all these these quote unquote resources, and what they really truly mean to to the life of Nespers people. Are there any other questions? All right, no more. So thank you very much. Uh, have a good day. We'll see you again. You come back to the event on uh, the end of the month. There'll be other events. So. Keep an eye out. I don't. I don't know where those are being advertised. I think on we have a website, social media, all the social media people. So thank you.